and having lost so much blood that he couldn't even carry his own cross up the hill to be crucified. And then he's nailed to the cross, hands and feet, pierced through the side, punctured his lungs and his heart, taken down, wrapped in 75 pounds worth of burial cloth, placed in a tomb where he stayed for 36 hours at least without food, without water, without medical attention, probably still bleeding out, and then all of a sudden he comes to... Hey guys, I'm Bill Westers, and this is the Encountering Truth Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to the debut episode of the Encountering Truth Podcast. It's an apologetics podcast where we seek to build our faith by examining the evidence for Christianity and by encountering Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. As I said, this is our debut episode and I'm super excited about it, so we're just going to jump right in. So C.S. Lewis once said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. So which is it? Is it true and of infinite importance? Or is it just meaningless? And how do we know? Well, we could examine the cumulative case for Christianity, but ultimately it boils down to the truth of one singular event. What is that? The resurrection of Jesus. If that's true, all of Christianity is true. But if it's false, Christianity is meaningless. It's like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. And then he goes on to say, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. So, if all of Christianity rises and falls on the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how do we know if that happened? Is there any evidence? Well, Gary Habermas of Liberty University has come up with a list of what he calls the minimal facts of the resurrection. These are a list of facts that are widely accepted by almost all scholars, both Christian and non-Christian alike. Now, there's a, like I said, there's a whole list of these, but we'll focus on just a few. First of all, that Jesus died by Roman crucifixion and was buried in a tomb which was later found empty. And then soon afterwards, Jesus' disciples had real experiences that they believed to be appearances of the risen Jesus. And as a result of those experiences, their lives were changed and transformed to the point where they were willing to undergo severe persecution an excruciating death. So, if that is our evidence, what do we do with that? Okay, well, we would take, we can take a courtroom approach called abductive reasoning, where we take a list of all of the evidence and compare it with all of the explanations, all the possible explanations of the evidence, and see which explanation best accounts for all the evidence, which is the most reasonable inference or explanation of the evidence. See, that's what they do in a courtroom, right? They prove beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's this abductive reasoning courtroom approach. Now, well, let's take a look first of all then at the empty tomb. Why was the tomb empty? Well, one explanation says that maybe they went to the wrong tomb. But you'd have to ask yourself the question, would that actually cause conversion or would it just cause confusion? Remember, it was the appearances of the risen Jesus that transformed their lives. It wasn't an empty tomb. 
Because an empty tomb, that would just cause confusion. They'd be like, Wait, where does his body go? I don't, I don't get it. What happened? What do they do with the body? And so, not only that, but that, you know, of course that would cause confusion. But not only that, if they just went to the wrong tomb, what's the only thing that the Jews and the Romans would have had to do to bring an end to it all? Yeah, they would just have to bring out the body. Right? And say, hey, you guys went to the wrong tomb. Here's the correct tomb. And his body is still in it. Here it is. Let's move on with our lives. But they didn't do that. Why? Well, explanation number two. Well, maybe the body was stolen. Maybe the disciples stole the body. That would make them the liars and the deceivers here, wouldn't it? But that's what... The Bible says that the Jews paid the Roman guards to say. And so, so one of the things we have to remember here before we even get going with this is that, again, one of the common, uh, one of the minimal facts of the resurrection was that they actually believed that they saw the risen Jesus. Okay, but we'll, we'll put that aside for right now and... Let's just imagine that they actually did try to go down to the tomb to steal the body so they would have to get past the elite Roman guard and quietly roll away the huge stone in front of the tomb without waking the sleeping guard, who, by the way, would most certainly be executed for sleeping on the job if they were caught. Okay? But imagine that they did all of that, and then they stole the body, and they, they made up the story that he rose from the dead. Okay? Well, we'd have to ask ourselves, why this story? Okay? Because in their culture, they had a concept of a resurrection, but that was, that was a resurrection at the end of time, at the last day. That's what Martha talks about in regards to Lazarus. There, there was no concept in their mind of a Savior rising from the dead in the current time. Okay? So that was not even part of their mindset. Not only that, but think about who wrote all of this. Who wrote the Gospels? A bunch of men. Why would a bunch of men come up with a story where they were the fearful ones, hiding from the Jews, where the brave women marched down to the tomb and were the first to witness the risen Jesus. Especially in a culture where a woman's testimony was not even considered valid. And then we'd have to decide, okay, we'd have to ask, what would be their motive for misleading? J. Warner Wallace talks about the big three things that cause all of us to sin or, or people to commit crimes, and that's sex, money, and power. Okay, well, did the disciples get sex, money, or power out of this? Uh, we don't exactly have evidence of that, right? Okay, how about something more like prison, torture, death? And then why would they die for a lie. Yes, people die for a lie all the time, but they die believing the lie to be true. See, the disciples were in a unique position where they would know whether or not it was a lie. And yet, they died for it anyways, without ever recanting. And then finally, we'd have a couple guys that wouldn't exactly go along with this. A couple inconceivable co-conspirators. Do you know who they are? James, the skeptical, unbelieving half-brother of Jesus, and Paul, who was formerly Saul, the great persecutor of Christianity. These guys did not believe. They were skeptical. So they're not just going to go along with some made-up story. They would have to have some sort of significant event to change their minds and convert them to Christianity. Okay, well, here's another thing. Okay, so 
what if, what if, okay, what if maybe Jesus didn't actually die? This is another explanation, another theory out there. It's called the apparent death theory. Well, he just maybe just appeared to die. I call this the Monty Python theory. If you've ever seen Monty Python, I don't recommend it because it's not the most wholesome. But there's a scene where he's going through the town, bring out your dead, ringing the bell. And some guy carries his old assumed to be father or some grandfather, something like that. Here, would you take this one? And, and the old guy says, I'm not dead. I feel happy. <laughs> so, one of the things that we'd have to remember about this is that the Romans, they were expert executioners. They this was not their first rodeo, okay? They knew how to effectively kill someone. And they knew exactly what it looked like when they were dead. That's why they didn't have to break Jesus' legs when he was on the cross, because they could look at him and know this is what death looks like. And so, along with that, this would have to take some sort of medical mystery, right? To imagine, think about everything that Jesus went through, having been beaten within an inch of his life, and having lost so much blood that he couldn't even carry his own cross up the hill to be crucified. And then he's nailed to the cross, hands and feet, pierced through the side, punctured his lungs and his heart, taken down, wrapped in 75 pounds worth of burial cloth, placed in a tomb where he stayed for 36 hours at least without food, without water, without medical attention, probably still bleeding out. And then all of a sudden he comes to, unwraps himself, moves away the stone from the inside where there's no leverage, gets out of the tomb, walk, gets past the elite Roman guard, and then walks seven miles to Emmaus with holes in his feet. He would get to, get to Emmaus, get there and say to his disciples and say, Hey guys, look at me. I rose from the dead. I conquered death. <laughs> Disciples would say, Okay, Jesus, uh, you just have a seat here. We'll get you some water. Somebody call 911. <laughs> it would change the story a little bit, wouldn't it? Imagine him standing there in front of Thomas. Ow, don't touch me, Thomas. That hurts. <laughs> so... What if, okay, so here, let's look at the next possible explanation here. Maybe it was all a hallucination. Maybe they did see Jesus, but it was just a hallucination. Well, the problem with this theory is that there's no evidence of hallucinations ever being group experiences. Even if people did have simultaneous hallucinations, they wouldn't be the same. They're like dreams, Okay, and this wasn't just a one or two people here and there. There were at least a dozen appearances over a course of 40 days and to multiple different groups, one of which was over 500 people at one time, who Paul later says were still alive, many of whom were still alive. So basically saying, hey, if you don't believe us, go check it out with one of those 500 people that's still alive that witnessed it. So then, then it brings us back to another problem. If this were all just a hallucination, what could the road Jews and Romans do to bring it all to an end? Yeah, just bring out the body. The body is the buzzkill here, right? So these explanations, they, they fall short. Now, there are several other explanations that maybe we'll address in a future episode, uh, such as uh, Jesus, uh, the, the con man theory, or the copycat myth, or that he was a legend uh, that developed over time. Um, but ultimately, they, they too fall short. They're, they have similar weaknesses. They all have holes. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, why would there be so many other explanations? Well, because skeptics, they they know that none of them work, that they all have holes. They, they don't really account for all the evidence. So 
what then is the best explanation? Well, maybe it all actually happened. Maybe Jesus really did rise from the dead. It accounts for all the evidence. The only thing we have, the only step that we have to take is a belief in the supernatural. We can't rule out the supernatural a priori, meaning uh, ahead of time. Some people say, well, that can't happen because it's supernatural. It's not within the natural. That's the very thing we're trying to figure out. A resurrection would have to be supernatural. So you can't just say it couldn't happen because it doesn't happen. So does all of this prove the resurrection? Well, I, I guess it kind of just kind of depends on what you mean by prove, okay? If, if you imagine yourself going back to a courtroom, the, the courtroom picture here that we talked about earlier, that first of all, you have to remember that historical events can't be tested in a lab. They're not, they, you can't have empirical evidence for those. And so, and so they rely on a different type of evidence. They rely on historical evidence rather than empirical evidence. So, back to that courtroom approach. Imagine that in a murder trial, there is a, the prosecutor has developed a motive. They've figured out a motive. They've found fingerprints on a weapon. On the murder weapon, they've found DNA at the scene. Maybe they even found a body in the trunk of the suspect does this prove that that suspect is guilty of murdering i mean are there any possible other possible explanations of course there's possible explanations but the, those types of explanations okay this evidence would hold up pretty well in a court to convict someone of a murder beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes, there's all sorts of possible explanations, but are they reasonable? And so we have to apply that same approach to this, to the resurrection. Are there possible explanations? Yeah, we just went through a few of them. But are they reasonable? Do they really account for all the evidence? If we don't rule out the supernatural ahead of time, then I'd say the resurrection, the evidence for the points pretty well to the resurrection that it actually happened. And if we can acknowledge and recognize that the greatest miracle of all time already occurred, and that would be the creation of the universe, creating everything, creating all of this out of nothing, would take a miracle. And if that's already occurred, then a resurrection miracle is at least possible. So, thank you guys so much for listening to this debut episode of the Encountering Truth podcast. Listen, if you enjoyed this, if you feel like it was valuable and you got something out of it, I would love for you to please make sure to to share it with your friends, post it on social media, and just really help us to be able to reach more people as we try to break down this evidence in an understandable way for people to make that step towards Christ. And so subscribe to the podcast so that you don't miss any of the great things that we have coming up on here. And uh, don't forget to give us that five-star review wherever you li listen to your podcast. So thank you guys again so much. And until next time, make sure to talk to someone, have a conversation, share the evidence, and help someone encounter the truth. <laughs>